Section 8.10, Taylor's Remainder Theorem. So at the beginning of this lecture, I'm recapping the function we talked about at the end of the last video. It's this pathological function for which we showed that all derivatives of all orders at zero are zero. That is, every derivative of this function at zero is zero. Therefore, we show that if you form the Maclaurin series for this function, all of the Maclaurin or Taylor coefficients are zero, so that this is identically a zero infinite series. That is, it converges to zero for all values of x, when clearly this function is not equal to zero for all values of x. In fact, it is definitely non-zero for all non-zero values of x. So what we've produced here with this example again is this pathological example of a function for which the power series generated from that function doesn't actually represent that function. And that really is the key issue or concern in this section 8.10. When we construct a Taylor series or generate a Taylor series from a function, when can we be sure that that Taylor series actually equals or represents the function from whence it came. Okay, so what we're going to do now is, to answer this question, turn back to those Taylor polynomials that we talked about last time. So we recall that when we have a Taylor series for a function, and again we mean nth derivative at some center over n factorial times x minus a to the n, if we're talking about a general Taylor series centered at a, and we know that we can take partial sums of this Taylor series, and that's what we call the Taylor polynomials. So we talked about P0, P1, P2, P3, and so on, which was the sequence of partial sums, where in general, Pn was the nth degree polynomial that looked like this. And again, what we mean by that is f of a plus f prime of a over 1 factorial times x minus a plus second derivative of function at a over 2 factorial x minus a squared plus dot 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 up to the nth degree term for which the Taylor coefficient is the nth derivative of the function at the center over n factorial, and again times x minus a to the nth. And of course we understand that this is a partial sum, so we're only adding up the first n plus 1 terms of this infinite series. That means if I write this Taylor series as the first n plus 1 terms, which is that Taylor polynomial, plus what we've been calling the tail, obviously again that tail is what determines the convergence of this series and in the end ultimately if it does converge, what does it converge to? Alright, just to give that tail a name, let's call that tail Rn of x where that R stands for remainder. And so what we're saying is any Maclaurin or Taylor series can be written as the first n plus 1 terms, which is that nth degree Taylor polynomial, plus all of the infinitely many leftover terms. So down here what we're saying is we can write n equals 0 to infinity and again, I'm just writing up our Taylor series one more time. We can write it as the nth degree Taylor polynomial plus the leftovers. Of course, what is that first term and the leftovers? It would be the n plus first derivative at a over n plus 1 factorial times x minus a to the n plus 1 plus dot dot dot. And what we're saying is this part that I just erased, this part is the tail. 
and that's the part we're calling Rn of x. Okay, so there are two basic theorems we want to talk about in this section. The first one will say, suppose f of x is differentiable all orders on I, where I is an open interval centered at A, and suppose the series n equals 0 to infinity, and of course what we're building here is um, the Taylor series. Suppose this converges on I. And of course what we're setting up there is the Taylor series generated by F with an open interval of convergence I. And of course to build the Taylor series I have to be differentiable of all orders because that is the power series, the unique Taylor series for a function. So let's say we've done that. Let's say we've got the Taylor series and we've got our interval of convergence I. Then we can say f of x and the Taylor series will actually be equal, and let me put stress on that. In other words, when I say equal, I mean that when I evaluate each side of that equation at a particular x value, I will get the same value. So, for example, if I put in f of 1 half, and over here I put 1 half in where that x is, and I take the limit and compute the value of the series, I get exactly the same value as 1 and a half. Okay, so that's what I mean by the red equals. I mean the power series actually converges to the value f of x. This will happen if and only if the limit as n goes to 0 of that remainder or tail of the series we talked about is 0. And I'm not going to prove this theorem here. It's, it's quite intricate, uh, but suffice it to say this seems reasonable. It should seem reasonable. If I expect this function to converge to something, I would expect this Taylor remainder, the R of x, to go to 0. Uh, again, think about what you're saying. If f of x is represented by its power series, and that power series or Taylor series can be written as the nth degree Taylor polynomial plus that leftover remainder, then as I take the limit as n goes to infinity, I would expect this guy, which is really the error of approximating my function with this nth degree Taylor polynomial to go to zero. That is, as we talked about yesterday in the picture uh, example with e to the x, I would expect the approximation of the Taylor polynomial, nth degree Taylor polynomial, to get better and better and better as n gets larger. And if that's the case, I would expect this error to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So that definitely is not a proof, but this does seem plausible that I would need this limit of that remainder to be zero. Okay, and notice this is an if and only if, meaning if this limit of this remainder is zero, then the Taylor series does actually equal the function that generated it. And conversely, if the function is equal to the Taylor series that it generates, then that means the limit of this remainder has to be zero. Um, again, we're not going to prove this, but the idea, again, should be pretty plausible. If I think f of x is equal to pn of x plus rn of x, uh, again, that is the same thing as saying rn of x is equal to f of x minus pn of x. And if I took the limit as n goes to infinity of both sides, then, of course, the right side limit as n goes to infinity of f of x is just f of x f of x is just some value of the function. 
minus the limit as n goes to infinity of p n of x. Okay, remember, p n of x, while those are the Taylor polynomials, those are also the partial sums of our Taylor series. So if that Taylor series converges, this is just the limit of the sequence of partial sums, which means this is equal to the value of this series if it converges. And if the limit of that series is actually going to equal the function value, then that means the right side of this equation is zero, which means the limit of the remainder would also have to be zero. Okay, that's not a formal proof, but that's just sort of a, a sketch of the, the logic behind it. Okay, now we come to the second theorem. And before I go ahead and state that theorem, let's just note that uh, of these two theorems, one will have a practical use and the other is more theoretical. This first one is the theoretical one that tells us when we're guaranteed a function is represented by the Taylor series that it generates. Uh, this is not something we're really going to have to check. Um, in fact, I can say now that if you did take the time to go back and check any of these basic Taylor series that we've developed over the last few sections, that is the standard Taylor series for e to the x, sine x, cosine x, tan inverse x, ln 1 plus x, ln 1 minus x. So all those Taylor series and power series that we've developed either by using Taylor's formula in the previous section or by using tricks like differentiation and integration in the series in the section before that, um, if you take the limits as n goes to infinity of the r and of x for any of those series, you'll find that they're all zero, which means all of those functions are indeed represented by their Taylor series. Now, sometimes finding this limit or verifying that it's zero can be difficult. Um, like I said, we're not really going to spend much time doing this, but this does give us a theoretical foundation and a criterion to know when we actually have a Taylor series that represents the function that generated it. It's the second theorem that's the more useful one for us. And this one actually is much harder to prove. We're not going to do a proof of this here. Um, it does rely heavily on the mean value theorem. I'll just say that much. But the theorem says if we have our Taylor series, centered at A, and that equals the nth degree Taylor polynomial plus that remainder, then we can actually say something about what that remainder looks like. Right now, all I know is that that remainder is that infinite tail of the series. Okay, and that's not really that helpful to us. But this theorem, which is really the one that I'm calling the Taylor's remainder theorem, says that R of x will be equal to the following. It will be equal to the n plus first derivative of the function at c, I'll say what c is in a minute, over n plus 1 factorial times x minus a to the n plus 1, where c is some number between x, which is the value that I'm evaluating this function at, and a, which is the center of the series which is this guy. All right, now, like I said, no, we're not going to prove this here, but uh, when I say or allude to the fact that the, the main tool you use to prove this is the mean value theorem, uh, this statement right here should definitely make you realize that the mean value theorem is probably somehow involved in the proof. That sounds like a mean value theorem type statement that there exists some number between two other numbers such that 
blah blah is true. All right, now if you think about the mean value theorem, um, the mean value theorem always asserted the existence of the C, but it never told you how to find it. It just said that it would exist, and that's the same thing here. I, I won't usually be able to determine that C. This theorem just says there is a C, and it's a number between X and A, that is between the X value that you're evaluating this function at and the center of the series, such that that tail remainder, that error leftover, is actually equal to this expression. And notice this does something pretty interesting. One more time, note that the Taylor series we're saying is Pn of x, which uh, here, just this uh, one more time, I'll write out a few terms of that. We know the first term is f of 0. We know the second term is f prime, I'm sorry, f of a f prime of a over 1 factorial x minus a. And by the way, just to remind us, we know that when you put just these two terms together, that's p1 of x, and that's the tangent line. That's just the tangent line. But then, of course, we continue all the way up to the nth degree term, which would be the nth derivative at a over n factorial x minus a to the n, plus, okay, what would the next term in this series be? The very next term would be n plus first derivative at a over n plus 1 factorial times x minus a to the n, and then we would continue that, and I'll just write one more, n plus second derivative at a over n plus 2 factorial times x minus a and this should be this should be n plus 1 right here because this one would be n plus 2 plus dot 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 okay so notice what we're saying here we're saying the tail of this series after we compute pn is this guy which we're calling rn so let me just write that here this part is pn the part I have shaded in green is Rn, but we're saying Rn can actually be captured with just this term, which is the next term after Pn, if we plug just the right number in to our function. And where do we plug it? We replace this A with some mystery C that is between A and X. So it's, it's quite a miraculous theorem, actually, because it says we can replace this entire tail of this series by just looking at this next term where we simply evaluate this n plus first derivative at some other number besides a. It's some mystery number between a and x. Okay, so... We'll do some examples now, and most of them, like I said, are going to concern this theorem because we want to do practical problems where we're approximating functions using Taylor series. But before I get into those examples, let's just do one example to illustrate the previous theorem, the one that uh, gave us a condition that guarantees when the Taylor series converges to our function value. And let's use the example of f of x equals sine x. Uh, we've already constructed the Taylor series for this one. We said it was n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. And of course what we're saying is that Taylor series can be written as an nth degree partial sum of the first n plus 1 terms plus some remainder. We know what that remainder would look like now. The remainder theorem we just stated up here says that that Rn of x would be equal to 
the n plus first derivative at some number c over n plus 1 factorial times x minus, now by the way, this is the Maclaurin series. So actually what I should be putting in here where that a is, is 0. And this would be x minus 0 to the n, so that would just be x to the n. Where c is some number between, okay, what does it say? It says c should be a number between a and x, where a is the center of your series and x is the x value you're evaluating this function at. Well, x is just x, but the center of this series is 0 since we're doing the Maclaurin series. All right, again, am I usually going to actually be able to determine that c value? The answer is no. But as you'll see here in a minute with how we're going to use these things, we don't really need to know the c. Um, here's why, for example, with what I want to do with this problem. So think about what all of these derivatives look like at 0. The function is sine x. And without going through the cycle, we know that all derivatives of sine x are going to be plus or minus cosine x plus or minus sine x. That's one of the nice things about sine x. It has, there's a limited number of derivatives you're going to get if you take successive derivatives. Okay, what's the other nice thing about sine x and cosine x? Well, they're all bounded by negative 1 and 1. That means if I took f of x equals sine x and I took any derivative of that function at any value and I asked you what is the size or bound on the size of that function, you could reasonably say it's less than or equal to 1. And again, it wouldn't matter which derivative I stopped on, and it wouldn't matter what value I evaluated any of these derivatives at. They would all be less than or equal to 1 in absolute value. All right, that's important because it allows me to do the following. Look at r of x. Let's take the absolute value of it, which in this case would be the absolute value of this guy. Okay, and by the way, I see that I uh, made the same mistake a second time. This should be n plus 1 right here. All right, so what would that be? We're saying this part would just be a plus or minus cosine or plus or minus sine evaluated at 0. Okay, so that's going to be plus or minus 1. Uh, what happens if I replace that 0? And by the way, I'm really goofing things up here, sorry. That 0 was supposed to be a C. I know that's what I said, but I didn't write it. Which, of course, is what I said down here, where C is some number between X and 0. Okay, again, though, what do we know about every one of these derivatives at C? They're all bounded by 1. That means down here, I could say that the absolute value of this remainder is less than or equal to x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. And that's simply because this derivative, or any of the derivatives of sine x, will all be bounded by 1 in size, no matter what c I plug into them. All right, now, that means what? It means r of x is definitely less than the absolute value of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. And since it is an absolute value that we're talking about, it's also going to be greater than or equal to 0. Now, what do I know about the limit as n goes to infinity of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial? And you should recall that that's a basic limit that we've proved and used, used several times now. We've proven that that limit is equal to 0 for any value of x. So no matter what constant x value I substitute right here, uh, the factorial on the bottom is always going to beat 
that power of x in the top in the long run, and this limit is zero. So if this limit is zero, and obviously this limit is zero, then by the sandwich theorem, I know this limit also has to be zero. Okay, what have we just illustrated here? We've illustrated, or we're showing an example to illustrate the first theorem of this section, which is if the limit of R of x is zero, then I know what? I know the power series derived or generated by this function actually equals the function. In other words, what I can say now at this point is that sine x is actually equal to, and there's the big emphasis, it is actually equal to the infinite series n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. Again, in the sense that if I evaluate sine x at some x value inside the interval of convergence, and I evaluate this Taylor series at that same x value, this Taylor series will converge to the value of sine x. Those two quantities will be exactly equal. I am guaranteed that because the limit as n goes to infinity of this remainder, this r sub n, r sub n of x is 0. All right, now let's turn to some examples using the Taylor remainder theorem, which is the one that allows us to get a handle on the size or magnitude of that R of x. And again, remember, and this is the important part, once we've shown that f of x is represented by its Taylor series, what we're saying is every function can be written as an nth degree Taylor polynomial plus the leftover, and that leftover, that remainder, is actually the error, right? It's the difference between my function and my nth degree Taylor polynomial. So in that sense, this R of x, this leftover, really is the error. So if I can figure out how to get control over the size of this R of x, that is, if I can control how big it is, then I automatically have control over the error of approximating f of x with the nth degree Taylor polynomial. So let's look at this example. We'll say use the Maclaurin series for e to the x to approximate e to the one-half accurate to four decimal places. Okay, for starters, if we're going to approximate something accurately to four decimal places, it means we want the error to be no greater than 0 0.00005. So for starters, uh, there's a concrete number or maximum error that we're trying not to exceed to make sure we're accurate to four decimal places. So that means I could have equivalently stated this problem as uh, let's use the Maclaurin series for e to the x to approximate e to the one half with an error less than 0 0.00005. That would be the same problem. Okay. What is the error in approximating by using the Maclaurin series? It's R of x. Okay, it's R of x for the Taylor series for e to the x. Okay, what is the Taylor series for e to the x? It's n equals 0 to infinity x to the n over n factorial. And now we know, or at least I've told you, that for the standard functions, for which we've already derived Taylor series, all of those Taylor series actually do represent their functions on the intervals of convergence. And so the Taylor series for e to the x, that is this one, actually represents f of x for values of x on the interval of convergence. And you may recall that 
the interval of convergence for this e to the x Taylor series is actually all real numbers. All right, now, what are we trying to do? We're trying to determine f of 1 half, which means we're actually trying to evaluate this Taylor series at x equals 1 half. Okay, and remember, we're saying that that Taylor series is actually the nth degree Taylor polynomial of x plus the remainder, or error, also at x. And of course, what's the x value that we're evaluating both of those at? At 1 half, because that is the x value. All right, now, that means the game here is what? It's to approximate f of 1 half, which is e to the 1 half, using a finite Taylor polynomial, where we're plugging in x equals 1 half. And we just need to figure out how big does this n need to be so that this error, this rn of 1 half, is less than 0 0.00005. Okay, that means we need to look at this thing. So, of course, we're going to look at the absolute value because we're interested in the magnitude of that error. And remember, that error could be positive or negative. That's why we're using absolute values. So we'll look at the absolute value of Rn of x for this function. And we might as well go ahead and plug in 1 half for the x because that is the x value we're evaluating at. All right, what would this be equal to? it would be equal to the absolute value of the nth derivative of this function at some number c. So here's the, the hitch. It's that mystery number c that we don't know. The only thing I do know is what? That this c will be between the center of the series, which is 0, and the x value that I'm evaluating this function at, which is 1 half. So that's the only thing I know about that C. Other than that, I know that this Taylor remainder will be equal to the nth derivative at C, and that should be n plus first derivative, over n plus 1 factorial times x minus a to the n plus 1. And of course, in this case, a is 0. So this part would just be x to the n plus 1. But what's x? Again, it's 1 half. So that means this part is just 1 half to the n plus 1. Okay, again, just to make sure we're clear on this, we're saying Rn of x is equal to the n plus first derivative at c over n plus 1 factorial times x minus a to the n plus 1. So notice what I've done in red up here. There's my C, which you can see right there. What's the other thing I've done? I've replaced A by 0, because this is a Maclaurin series centered at 0. And then what's the other thing I've done? I've replaced X by 1 half, because we are evaluating this function at 1 half. OK, putting all that together, I have Rn of 1 half absolute value is equal to. All right, so let's look at what we've got inside absolute values here. For starters, we've got this n plus first derivative of c. Remember, what is our f of x here? It's e to the x. And what's one of the nice things about e to the x? All the derivatives are e to the x. So that means this guy should be e to the c over n plus 1 factorial times 1 half to the n plus 1. All right, now here's where you just take your time and be careful and think things through. What do we know about c? We know c is between 0 and 1 half. So of course, here's 0, here's 1 half. c is somewhere in there. What's the function we're talking about right here? We're talking about e to the c. I know e to the x is an increasing function always. So on the interval 0 to 1 half, if I ask you, 
what's the maximum value or the upper bound on e to the x on the interval 0 to 1 half, which is where this c is, it would definitely be e to the 1 half. That would be the upper bound on the size of e to the c if c is a number between 0 and 1 half. Meaning, I could definitely say that this is less than or equal to e to the 1 half over n plus 1 factorial times 1 half to the n plus 1. Now, you know, if you can think back or remember back to when we played estimation games like this in Calc 1 when we were using Simpson's rule and the trapezoidal rule, uh, we weren't looking for the best estimate on the error. We were just looking for an estimate. So two different people constructing one of these little estimates like I'm doing here might do things a little differently. Uh, but the nice thing is, in the end, if I apply this remainder theorem, I'll be sure that I'm at least approximating the function with the desired accuracy, no matter how I handle this. And what I mean by that is, this next part, I'm going to ask, uh, is there anything I can say about e to the 1 half? And I can't really go to a calculator and plug in e to the 1 half because that's actually the problem that we're doing. It's, it's uh, circular and unfair for me to try and actually use a value for e to the 1 half to produce an estimate on the size of this when that's actually the problem that we're doing. However, there's nothing wrong with us using what we know about e, that is that it's about 2.718. So, of course, I know e is clearly less than 3, which means since e is an increasing function, I can say e to the 1 half is definitely less than the square root of 3. And I know the square root of 3 is less than lots of things. I know square root of 3 is about 1.73. Uh, but here's where I use my, my judgment. Look at this expression you've got. And what do I see in there? I see an n plus 1 factorial on the bottom. And what's the other thing I see? I see this uh, 2 to the n plus 1 down there. Now, wouldn't it be great if I could somehow relate this to 2? And in fact, you notice I can. If e to the 1 half is less than square root of 3, square root of 3 is definitely less than 2. Um, I don't have to do any hocus pocus to have an easy upper bound estimate that says e to the 1 half is less than 2. And by choosing that one, notice what we get now. We get that this guy is less than 2 over n plus 1 factorial times 2 to the n plus 1. And I have dropped the absolute value bars now because everything there is, is positive now. And notice what happens. I can actually put these two together now. And I can say that this is 1 over 2 to the n times n plus 1 factorial. All right, summing up, what do I have? I have that the absolute value of that r sub n error at 1 half is less than, I have to go with the, the weakest inequality, in this string of inequalities I just produced. It's less than 1 over 2 to the n times n plus 1 factorial. And what do I want this error to be less than? I want it to be less than 0 0.00005. So I want 1 over 2 to the n times n plus 1 factorial to be less than 0 0.00005. Or in other words, I want 2 to the n times n plus 1 factorial to be greater than the reciprocal of that, uh, which should be 20,000, I believe. Now, you're not going to solve an inequality like that algebraically by hand, not when you have an exponential function mixed together with a factorial like that. But this is where I would simply uh, use a calculator or computer or even by hand make a table and what I'm looking for is the first value of n for which this is true.
and you can check this for yourself, but uh, when I ran the calculations, the first one I came up with was n equals 5. If my calculations are correct that I have written down here, when n equals 5, I have that this guy is 0 0.00004, but when n equals 4, I came up with 0 0.0005. Okay, and of course we're trying to get this error to be less than 0 0.00005. Uh, so that tells me I'd have to go out at least to n equals 5. Okay, now once I've reached n equals 5, now what can I say? I can say that e to the 1 half can be approximated by using P5, that is the 5th degree Taylor polynomial, with an error that does not exceed... our n of one half, in this case our five of one half. Which we have just demonstrated is less than 0 0.00004. Because that's what I got right there when n was equal to five. Okay, what that means is if I check e to the one half and I approximate it with p five of one half. Okay, again, what is what is p5 of x for the function e to the x? We know it's 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial. So there's what p5 of x looks like. So what's p5 of 1 half look like? It looks like 1 plus 1 half plus one-half squared divided by two, which would be one-eighth, plus one-half cubed divided by six, which would be one over 48, uh, plus, and I'll just be lazy here on the rest, one-half to the fourth over 24, plus one-half to the fifth over 120. If you were to calculate this, and I'll leave this for you to check, if you calculate this, and then go to your calculator and see what your calculator actually says about e to the one half. The difference between those two should be less than 0 0.00005. And again, you can check me on this, but when I ran this in the calculator, I came up there with an error of about 0 0.00002. And I'm just copying off the calculator here. Looks like. Two, three, uh, definitely less than that point zero 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 five we were after. Okay, so this is a pretty comprehensive example of what this process looks like of using this Rn of x to estimate how large n needs to be to use your Taylor polynomial to approximate a function at a value. Uh, let's do one more example just to see it a second time. And I'll, I'll do a slightly different application this time. And I think this one's pretty cool. Um, if you're into this sort of thing, what I want to look at is the integral 1 half to 1 of sine x over x, uh, which if you look at that for a while, you should realize there are no integration techniques we have that can be applied to that. The only one you might consider using if you were trying to go through the list might be integration by parts. Um, it's, it's not going to work. There is no closed antiderivative form for sine x over x. So that means if I'm going to evaluate this definite integral, uh, the only way I'd have to do it using, say, Calc 1 methods would be Simpson's rule or trapezoidal rule. Uh, those would be a little clunky here. Uh, although I will say, if you remember doing those methods, attached to each of those methods uh, were upper bound error estimates. And if you remember what they looked like, uh, it, it might strike you that they looked kind of like terms in a Taylor series. And so if you go back and look at those sometime, uh, that is where those upper bound formulas are coming from. They're coming from Taylor series. 
Uh, but for our example here, uh, what's the game we're going to play? Well, since I don't know an antiderivative for sine x over x, uh, we're going to do what we did a few sections back. If we can't find an antiderivative for this function, can we find a power series for this function and then integrate the power series? All right, so of course, sine x over x, I can simply look at that as 1 over x times the power series for sine x, which we know now is negative 1 to the n x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. And so if I multiply the 1 over x back into the series, then of course it's going to end up being an extra factor of x in the bottom. And then I know I can simply cancel out that x with one of these x's up here. And what does that leave me? It leaves me infinite series n equals 0 to infinity negative 1 to the n x to the 2n over 2n plus 1 factorial. And so that means our problem now becomes one of integrating 1 half to 1 infinite series n equals 0 to infinity negative 1 to the n x to the 2n over 2n plus 1 factorial. Okay, what's that? Well, we know that when we integrate term by term, we simply take the antiderivative term by term using the standard power rule for integration of powers of x. Now, just to make this a little uh, easier to look at, let's say this is 1 half to 1 of, let's see, let's write out a fir the first few terms in this power series right here for 1 over x times sine x. So what's the first term? It would be when n is 0. That would be negative 1 to the 0 times x to the 0 over 1 factorial. Uh, that would be 1. What's the next term? It would be negative because now it's n equals 1. So it would be negative 1 to the 1 times x squared over 3 factorial. The next term would be positive and it would now be x to the 4th because we're hitting the even powers here. Uh, what would the denominator be? It would be 2 times 2 plus 1, it would be 5 factorial. Okay, and of course now we're actually seeing the pattern played out that is spelled out in this formula. The denominators are odd factorials, the numerators are even powers of x, where that even power is 1 less than the odd number in the denominator. And now that I've got a clear handle on that pattern, I know that the next term would be negative x to the 6 over 7 factorial plus x to the 8th over 9 factorial minus x to the 10th over, and this should have been 9 factorial, over 11 factorial, and so on. Okay, now, this is a little weird to write, but what I'm going to do is take the antiderivative now, which means, of course, we're talking about x minus x cubed over 2 times, or rather 3 times 3 factorial, plus x to the 5th over 5 times 5 factorial, minus x to the 7th over 7 times 7 factorial, and so on. At least there's a very nice pattern there. Now, I don't know if I have enough terms written out there. Actually, I do. But in general, uh, we're going to have to figure out how many terms I need to get a certain accuracy. Now, I haven't really said that here because uh, I hadn't, uh, well, I do have one written down here. But let's go ahead and write down what I had in mind. Let's find an approximation of this. So approximate the value of this integral uh, to five decimal places. I.e. the error needs to be less than 0 0.000005. 
So a five in that sixth decimal place preceded by five zeros. All right, now, uh, again, don't forget down here, this is the antiderivative, and you're evaluating it from one half to one. So there is one little tricky thing here just to be aware of. Now, once I say it, it'll be known, and it won't be tricky, but just be careful. You do realize there are two infinite series calculations here. This is, after all, an infinite series. And I know that I'm going to plug 1 into that first. And then I'm going to plug 1 half. So what I mean by that is if this guy is, let's call it uh, g of x, just to give it a name, then what we are going to do is take g of 1 minus g of 1 half. Okay, but what are we going to do to calculate g of 1? We're going to use a finite number of terms. We're going to use a finite number of terms to estimate the value of this infinite series at 1. Then we're going to do it again for 1 half. We're going to use a finite number of terms to evaluate this infinite series at x equals 1 half. Once we get those two values, we subtract them. Just be careful here. Notice this is an infinite series estimate. And here's the important part. This one is a different series estimate using a different x value. And you do see that the number of terms I use to estimate this infinite series at 1 may be different from the number of terms that's necessary to estimate this infinite series at 1 half if I want both of them to have no larger an error than 0 0.000005. Okay, so what I'm saying is I can't just plug in the 1 and the 1 half for the same number of terms and expect that that's good for both of them. I need to make sure the number of terms I'm using to calculate this one is sufficient, sorry, having trouble in my pen. I need to make sure the number of terms I use to calculate this one gives me an error for that one that is less than 0 0.000005. And I also need to make sure that when I calculate this one, which may require a different number of terms in this one, that my error on that one is also less than 0 0.000005. Then when I subtract them, I know that I'm using two numbers both of which have the desired accuracy. All right, I'm going to write out what I calculated, and you can check my calculations later if you want to. I'm just going to say that this is approximately equal to, uh, here's what I get when I evaluate this series at 1. I get 1 minus 0 0.05 uh, repeating plus point zero zero one six repeating minus point zero 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 two eight three plus point zero 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 three and of course there would be a plus dot 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 minus now I'm going to plug in the one half which means I'm going for that one. So if I plug one half into each of these, what I get is 0.5 minus 0 0.006944 plus 0 0.000521 minus point zero 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 two plus dot 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 okay so notice here when I look at the evaluation of this series at one I notice that the first term whose absolute value is less than this error I'm looking for is this term right here it's point zero 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 three Okay, notice the term before that, the point zero 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 two eight three is not less than that error. Okay, that means to estimate this series, that is 
my antiderivative series at 1 with this desired accuracy, I need to take this evaluation out to those four terms, which notice this came from the 0 degree term, the 1 degree term, the 2 degree term, the 3rd degree term. In other words, I'm using the 3rd degree Taylor polynomial to estimate what happens with this antiderivative at 1 because this is the first term error or the first term that goes below that error of 0 0.00005. Okay, notice in the second part where I'm evaluating 1 half, the first time I see that remainder term or that last term go below this error is the last one, that one I wrote right there, which means for evaluating at 1 half, it's a different number of terms. It's the first three terms. So if you see what I'm saying there, to evaluate this antiderivative at 1, I needed four terms in this antiderivative series. And to evaluate it 1 half, I only needed three terms. It would not be sufficient to only use three terms for each of the two. I need to make sure that I'm calculating each of these convergent series values with the desired accuracy. Now when I combine them, we know that adding and subtracting numbers with the same accuracy will give us numbers with that same accuracy. Okay, I didn't actually calculate this up here, but I know now based on what I'm doing with this Taylor remainder formula that the overall error in my calculation of this integral will be less than that 0 0.000005. Okay, good place to stop, and hopefully this gives you two solid examples of how to use the Taylor's remainder to estimate values of functions using the Taylor series.